So welcome, folks. Um, we're going to dive right in. I know half of your, well, I know all of you are exhausted getting ready for the lab exam. So we'll just dive right in. So folks, just for the movie, it's um, October 15, 2019, Tuesday. And we are continuing our discussion of microbial genetics. And we are continuing our discussion of DNA replication. And remember, we're using E. coli as our uh, model organism. So recall that before the bacteria, the E. coli can divide in two, right? It has to make a copy of its bacterial chromosome. So that's what we've been looking at. So last time we looked at um, a, a list of problems and then solutions that E. coli has evolved, um, problems faced when uh, trying to replicate the chromosome. So let's just walk through a list of these um, solutions, folks. So let me. I'll back up here to slide 17, but let me just fast forward to slide 18, because this will be like a quiz for us, okay? So folks, remember that um, one of the problems that E. coli bacteria face is their chromosome, to fit into that tiny, tiny, tiny little cell, the chromosome is in which state? It's supercoiled, right? Supercoiled. And to copy the chromosomal DNA, we know the double-stranded DNA, it, the um, two strands will have to be separated to make the single-strand templates. And the cell can't separate the double-stranded DNA into two strands if it's supercoiled, right? So folks, what was the solution? Um, what was the solution the bacteria used to relieve the supercoiling? Good, bacterial gyrase, awesome. So we said that bacterial gyrase will help the E. coli relieve the supercoiling in preparation for chromosome replication, also in preparation for transcription. Okay? And we mentioned a specific antibiotic that will inhibit bacterial gyrase. Do you remember which antibiotic that was? Ciprofloxacin, right? It's an example of a quinolone, a fluoroquinolone. So um, it became famous to the public when many people are suffering from inhalation anthrax, right? So they're giving everybody ciprofloxacin. So, so folks, why would ciprofloxacin inhibit replication of bacteria? Right, so if the bacteria are gonna um, divide in two, they have to copy their chromosome, right? So why would ciprofloxacin prevent the bacteria from dividing in two? What has to happen before the bacteria divide in two? Right, they have to replicate their chromosome, and to do that, they have to relax the chromosome, right? So if you can prevent the chromosome from being relaxed, the bacteria can't copy the chromosome, and therefore they can't um, divide in two, right? And we'll see later, folks, the chromosome also has to be relaxed for transcription to occur, and that's going to be the first step in protein synthesis. Good, good job, you guys. All right, and then, folks, we said that um, for the bacterium to copy its chromosome, it has to break the hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA in the chromosome to create single st strand templates. So folks, what was the enzyme that bacteria use to unzip their double-stranded DNA to create the two single strand templates? What's that enzyme? Helicase, right? And we said the helicase, it's gonna be working at that replication fork, right? and it's breaking the hydrogen bonds between the double-stranded DNA of the old parent, creating our single-strand templates, right? Okay, but then folks, remember how we said that single-strand DNA, it's kind of vulnerable. It can re-anneal. What does re-anneal mean? The two single strands can come back together and form the, the hydrogen bonds, so it re-anneals, it comes back together, and now we don't have our templates. What else could happen to the single-strand DNA, folks? It could tangle, right? And what else could happen to single-strand DNA in a bacterium? Yeah, it could get hydrolyzed, right? Because bacteria have evolved enzymes that will recognize single-strand DNA as possible bacterial virus DNA, and those enzymes will hydrolyze it. So what was the solution, folks? How did the E. coli, how did the bacteria solve the, um, the challenge of trying to protect the single-strand DNA templates? SSBPs. What does SSBP stand for? Single strand binding proteins, right? So they'll bind and protect the single strand templates from reannealing, from tangling, and from being hydrolyzed, right? Okay, folks. Good. All 
All right. Now, we would think that at this point, and presuming that the cytoplasm of the E. coli is chock full of those um, nucleoside triphosphates, you would think that DNA polymerase could just bind at ORI and start copying the DNA. But there's another problem. What, what was the next problem, folks? Can DNA polymerase simply bind to a single-strand DNA template and start copying it, or does it have something else that it needs? Yes, exactly. It needs a short little nucleic acid primer, right? So how did, this, how did the bacteria solve this issue that DNA polymerase requires a short little nucleic acid primer to get, to get started with synthesis? What was the solution? Primase, Primase right? And folks, primase is a, is a special type of what? Yeah. RNA polymerase, good. So you guys, when um, primase binds, to the single-strand DNA template and starts using the template, what is primase going to make? Perfect, you guys. A short RNA primer, right? And um, is RNA made 5' prime to 3'? Prime? Yep. It follows the same rules as DNA synthesis, right? And is it going to be anti-parallel to the template? Yep, just like DNA synthesis. Awesome, you guys. All right. So we'll put our little primase here. And as soon as a short little primer has been made, now who can take over? Mm. Yeah, and do you remember, you guys, in, in E. coli, which number does most of the DNA synthesis? Mm. DNA polymerase 3, right? So it's kind of the workhorse with regard to DNA synthesis. So once that little primer is there, DNA polymerase will bump, bump it, right? And it'll, as it's working, it's going to bump off our single-strand binding proteins. So our DNA polymerase 3 will use the primer to get started. And what's DNA polymerase 3 going to make? What's DNA polymerase 3 going to make? DNA, good. And folks, remember that we said that once DNA polymerase 3 gets started here, it's just going to keep going, copy the chromosome all the way down to the termination of replication, right? So what kind of DNA synthesis is this? Once DNA polymerase starts, it continues. It doesn't stop. <laughs> Continuous? Good. And thus, we call this strand which strand? The leading strand. And we're going to see, you guys, it's almost like we're having a race. Okay? So this is called the leading strand. So the leading strand is made using what type of DNA synthesis? Con continuous DNA synthesis? Good, good, you guys. Okay, so that I think that's where we left off last time. Does that sound right, folks? Yeah. Okay, so let me just back up to our cartoon here. So we were saying that worked so well. Why don't we just do the same thing down here on the opposite strand, right? But folks, remember this opposite strand, this op opposite template strand, it has the opposite orientation of this template strand up there, and that's going to cause all kinds of problems. So, folks, let's, let's, just, let's see if we can do the same thing as we did up here. So, folks, why don't we do the same thing? Let's have um, primate make a short RNA primer, and then let's have DNA polymerase 3 come along, right, and make DNA. That worked really well on that opposite strand. But is something troubling you here with this approach? Are we breaking some of the rules? And what's, which rule are, are we breaking right here? Good, good, you guys. So remember, when we're making new DNA or RNA, it has to be anti-parallel to the template. And see how the way we've drawn it here, it's parallel, right? OK, so it's like, OK, you guys, if you're going to be like that, be difficult. Okay. So why don't I just do this? Uh, now I'm anti-parallel, but which rule am I breaking now? That's it. You got it. Remember, you guys, we can't synthesize 3' prime to 5'. Prime. The only end to which new incoming nucleotides can be added is the 3' prime hydroxyl end. So that's not going to work either. So, folks, we're ultimately going to see this opposite strand is going to be called the lagging strand for reasons hopefully we'll show. 
So the cell has to take a totally different approach to synthesize the lagging strand. So that's what we'll explain right now, how to synthesize the lagging strand. And the, the overall solution is to use a different type of DNA synthesis called discontinuous DNA synthesis. So we'll explain it, folks. So what the, um, what the cell will do is wait, it will wait for this replication fork to open up and primase will come in and synthesize a short RNA primer, three prime to, excuse me, five prime to three prime, sorry. And then DNA polymerase three will come on board and continue DNA synthesis, five prime to three prime. So you guys, are we obeying uh, the rule that nucleic acids are only synthesized five prime to three prime? Are we obeying that rule? Yeah. yeah. Are we obeying the rule that the new, DNA, the new DNA or RNA has to be anti-parallel? Yeah, we are, okay. And then the cell waits a little bit more, waits for the replication fork to open up a little bit wider and repeats that process. So short little RNA primer, DNA polymerase three takes over. Short little RNA primer, DNA polymerase three takes over. But now, is this making you feel uncomfortable? Like, that doesn't look right. Well, you know chromosomal DNA is an alternating RNA and DNA, right? So, hmm, what's the problem we have going on here? Do we want to get rid of the RNA and replace it with DNA, right? So that's the next problem, right? So how to remove RNA primers <coughs> and replace with what? Good, good. Okay. So the reason this is a problem, folks, is that DNA polymerase, right? DNA polymerase is synthesizing DNA. It hits an RNA primer and it can't do anything. It can't remove the RNA primer, it can't do anything. So what's the solution? This is so cool. So there's a relative, a related enzyme in E. coli called DNA polymerase 1. And guess what DNA polymerase 1 can do? What do we want to do? Yeah, DNA polymerase 1 can remove, can hydrolyze that RNA primer and replace it with what? DNA, yeah. Awesome. Right, so DNA polymerase 1 bumps into the RNA primer. It's going to fall off. DNA polymerase 1 will replace it, hydrolyze the RNA primer, and replace the RNA primer with, right. Okay, so folks, so if I ask you on the exam, how, how does the E. coli remove the RNA primer and replace with DNA? What was the solution? The solution is DNA polymerase one. Yes. What can DNA polymerase one do that yeah, DNA polymerase three can't do? What, what was the problem? Removing the RNA, replacing with DNA. So you guys, what can DNA polymerase one do that DNA polymerase three could not do? Yeah, remove the RNA primer and replace with DNA. Good, good job, folks. Okay, but we have another problem, right? And see, see how these, these are actually DNA fragments? The problem is DNA polymerase one, when it runs into the DNA fragment in front of it, it can't form a covalent bond. It can't link those DNA fragments together. So folks, these DNA fragments, they have a special name. They're called Okazaki fragments. So these are these little DNA fragments, All right? So now the cell has another problem. DNA polymerase three can't covalently link the Okazaki fragments. So should we add that to the problems list? Yeah. Okay. So the, the last problem is how to covalently link the Okazaki fragments. And as you guys might guess, a special enzyme 
enzyme has evolved to do just that. And the special enzyme, you guys, we can think of it like the glue stick, right, or the stapler. It's called ligase. And ligase ligates, covalently links the Okazaki fragments together. So right there, ligase binds, and what does it do? It forms a covalent bond between those two DNA fragments, those two Okazaki fragments. Right? Here's another, here's a one end of an Okazaki, another end of an Okazaki. Ligase binds and does what? Covalent links them, right? So folks, at the end of all, of all of this, you would never know that the lagging strand at one time was RNA, DNA, RNA, DNA. You would never know at one time it was DNA fragments that weren't linked together. So at the end of this process, there's no way to tell the lagging strand from the leading strand, right? But you guys, what we need to know is this, this opposite strand, it's synthesized using which kind of process? Discontinued, right? Remember, you guys, how DNA polymerase started and stopped. Started and stopped. Started and stopped, right? So it's called discontinuous DNA synthesis. And it's as if we were, like, watching a race between these two strands, right? There's a race. Who's, who's in the lead? You know, who's lagging behind? And it is misleading, folks, because indeed both strands are synthesized at about the same rate. But historically, the strand that's made by discontinuous DNA synthesis is called the lagging strand. Yeah, exactly. And you can just see it takes a little extra work, extra enzymes, to synthesize the lagging strand. Okay? So, folks, um, let me just quiz you really quick here. Let me go backwards. Um, so, folks, on, on the le lecture exam, say they were fill in the blanks. So, you guys, uh, um, how does the bacterium covalently link Okazaki fragments together? Ligase. Ligase, good. Um, how does the cell remove RNA primers and replace with DNA? DNA, DNA polymerase 1. Good job, you guys. Um, which enzyme carries out most of the DNA synthesis? Yeah, DNA polymerase 3. Um, what can DNA polymerase 1 do that DNA polymerase 3 can't do? Yeah, DNA polymerase 3 can't remove RNA primers and replace with DNA. Only DNA polymerase 1 can. Good job, you guys. Um, okay, now I get mixed up on these guys. So um, which enzyme unzips the DNA to go from double-stranded DNA to single-strand templates? What's the name of that enzyme? Helicase. And I do the same thing, you guys. I'm always flipping gyres and helicase. I don't know why, but I do. So, you guys, what's the enzyme that unzips a double stranded DNA to go from double strand to single strand templates? Helicase. Good. What's the enzyme that relaxes the chromosome supercoiling? Bacterial gyres. Okay. Which enzyme does ciprofloxacin inhibit? Bacterial gyres. Good. Good job, you guys. This year. Do I know my alphabet? G H. Maybe you guys, I don't know. This might be silly, but G comes before H. G is for gyrase. H is for helicase. I just thought about this. I think I'll have to do this when I'm making the key. Because often that's a real common mistake I'll do on the key. I'll get those two switched. I think maybe I need to write this down. First is G, then is H. First is gyrase, then it's helicase. Okay? You guys all right with that? Okay. And folks, this is just like great, a great slide um, for asking exam type questions, right? So make sure you, make sure you know the, uh, the function of the enzymes and proteins. Make sure you can explain, if it was a short answer, make sure you, that you can explain leading strand and lagging strand, continuous discontinuous DNA synthesis, um, the, the um, similarities and differences between DNA polymerase three and one. Okay. Um, Oh, and before we go on, you guys, this is really important because absolutely on lecture exam two, on lecture exam two, folks, there will be a short answer question comparing and contrasting DNA polymerases to RNA polymerases. So we need to do a little bit more work so we can um, get that answer correct. But before I do go on, you guys, this is not to make you crazy. It's just the opposite. In case this weekend you go home and you're trying to cartoon, um, 
DNA replication in E. coli, I need to tell you something. I'm not going to ask this on the exam, but I just need to tell you um, so, so you won't go crazy. So folks, notice how in the way we made our chromosome here, we said the, the new DNA strand on top is the um, leading strand and the DNA on the bottom is the lagging strand. If you try to finish this cartoon and look at DNA replication on the other side of ORI, the orientation flips. The strand up here is going to be the lagging strand. The strand down here will be the leading strand. And you guys, I'm going to put it on the board, not to make you crazy, but just in case you try to do it, you can see what I'm talking about, okay? I won't ask this on the exam. So on the other side of Ori, folks, our template strand orientation is going to be opposite. Right? So let, let me look at this. Here's, here's my five prime um, template. So if this is a five prime end, that means this is the what? The three prime end, right? And if this is the three prime end of this template, that means this is the five prime end, right? Okay. So what will happen on this flip side to get my, um, to obey my rules of the new strand being anti-parallel to the template and the five prime and three prime synthesis, this is what you're going to see on the other side. So what does this look like to you, you guys, that I'm doing on this other side? Is this continuous or discontinuous? It's discontinuous, right? Because remember, I have to be anti-parallel to my template, and I have to go 5 prime to 3. 5 prime to 3 prime, right? And the only way to do that is discontinuous. And also, you guys, it helps us understand how does that RNA primer get removed, right? So um, DNA polymerase 3 runs into that primer who takes over. DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA primer and replaces it with DNA, and then who ligates the two ends together? Ligates, right? So it helps us understand how that primer um, gets finished. And it's lovely down here, you guys, once DNA polymerase 3 gets started, what's it doing? Continuous, right? So this becomes, con this is uh, made continuous. This becomes the leading strand. And what's this, what kind of synthesis you guys is going on up here? Discontinuous. And thus, this is which strand? This is the lagging strand. Okay. And again, folks, I would not ask that on the exam. It's just that if you try to go home and cartoon the whole thing, it might make you think, like, did I not understand it or what the heck's going on? So that's the only reason I wanted to show it to you. Okay? You guys all right with that? Okay. So you guys, I'm going to erase this cartoon because now what we want to do is we want to do a table comparing and con contrasting DNA and RNA. And folks, if you don't want to write this down, if you look in your, um, your um, genetics notes from last time, we passed this out last time, and there's a bunch of extras here, you guys, so if you didn't get one, just grab one before you leave. And folks, if you turn to page three, this page gives you the information to... Um, to get 100% on the comparing and contrasting DNA polymerases to RNA polymerases. So we'll do a little bit of board work with it. Because indeed, you guys, that's how I would present it on lecture exam two. It'd be part of short answers. I'll have a table, and I'll have you fill in the different properties of the two polymerases. OK, so let me erase this. Oops, and I forgot to finish you guys. You guys, I didn't finish my solutions. How, how does the cell covalently link the Okazaki fragment? Sorry. Mine is excellent. Awesome. Good job. Lighty's. Good. Alrighty then. Okay. So this is going to be a short answer question on lecture exam two. In E. coli, we want to compare and contrast. DNA polymerase present to RNA polymerase. All right, guys. Okay, so, 
So first of all, what is made, or what is synthesized? So what does DNA polymerase make or synthesize? Yeah, DNA, right? So single-strand DNA complementary to the template, good. What does RNA polymerase make? RNA, right? Okay. In cells, so you guys remember, we're talking about cells. What's the template? What's the te good? What's the template for DNA polymerase? Good. Single strand DNA. Okay. What about for RNA polymerase? What's the template? The strand. We saw an RNA polymerase at work. Primase was a special example of an RNA polymerase. What was the template? Single strand DNA. Awesome. You got it. Okay. All right. Um, so both enzymes require those charged nucleoside triphosphates, so we're presuming the cytoplasm is filled with those. But now, you guys, now we're going to uh, talk about two um, traits um, in which DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase differ. So the first trait I think you guys know, and that is, is a primer required? So um, does DNA polymerase require a primer to start DNA synthesis? Yeah, remember, that was one of the problems for the little cell. Yeah. And folks, does RNA polymerase require a primer? Remember how the cell solved the problem of making a primer for DNA polymerase? It used a special type of RNA polymerase, right? So do you think RNA polymerases require primers? Nope. Nope. They can just land on single-strand DNA and start making complementary RNA. So that's a big difference, isn't it? All right? Okay, now the next feature, you guys, is something we haven't discussed, and it's actually related to why DNA polymerase requires a primer and RNA polymerases do not. So this amazing phenomenon, you guys, it's called proofreading or editing. So on the slide there, just about three-quarters of the way down, it says proofreading and editing. Okay, so let's, let's develop this concept first. So let's talk about first, folks, about mistake rates of um, DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases. And, and so we kind of understand what we mean. Let me pretend, folks, that this is a single strand of DNA. And I'll just come up with some random DNA sequence, right? And let's pretend that you are Let's pretend you are um, DNA uh, polymerase, right? So you're going to pretend you're DNA polymerase. And, and indeed, you guys, this is, this is the kind of question I'll ask you on the lecture exam. So I'm going to ask you to write the complementary DNA sequence if you are using this as your template. So this is your template. Okay, so this is going to be the new DNA. All right, you guys, so can you help me here? Can you tell me what the... Um, base sequence would be of the new DNA that you're going to synthesize using that as your template. A, A, T, T, K. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like, wait, wait, wait. Did I just put the wrong nucleotide, the wrong base in there? Yeah, so that's a mistake, you guys. And just like as humans, DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases, they make mistakes too. So let's put it in red, right? So this is a mistake. And just as, just as I, I was kind of up here going, ah, ah, and you guys were like, no, no, that's not right, yeah? DNA polymerase can detect these mistakes, and it's probably because of incorrect hydrogen bonding. Maybe there's a little distortion of the DNA when the wrong nucleotide is put in there. And what's so amazing, you guys, is DNA polymerase can recognize these mistakes and do what? Try again. It's like, like in the old days using whiteout, right? Or if this was on the word processor, you guys, when you make a mistake, you hit the backspace, right? And what does it do? It, it, it gets rid of the mistake and you try again. And what's so amazing, you guys, DNA polymerase can do that. DNA polymerase can recognize those mistakes, get rid of the incorrect nucleotide with the incorrect nitrogenous base and try again. So this is, I'll put it in blue, you guys, just so we recognize it. So did I just correct my mistake? Did I just correct my mistake, right? 
So this is an example of proofreading or editing, checking for incorrect nucleotides, checking for incorrect nitrogenous bases, and DNA polymerase can get rid of those wrong ones and try again. Okay, so this is our, our correction. And this is the process of editing, or another term for it is proofreading. Okay, so you guys, DNA polymerases can proofread and edit. And thank heavens, because remember, DNA is can proofread. Because remember, for cells, DNA is the genetic information of cells. That, that DNA is going to get passed on to all subsequent generations of cells directing protein synthesis, right? So if your DNA polymerase is making a lot of mistakes, you're going to end up with a lot of, of weird amino acid sequences in proteins. And thus, the proteins might not fold properly. You might lose function. So that could be lethal for the cell, right? But folks, um, does RNA polymerase make copies of genetic information for cells? Nope, it doesn't. So guess what RNA polymerase can't do? Yeah, RNA polymerases don't proofread. They don't need to. So what if you make a little mistake in the RNA? It's no big deal. Long term for the cell, right? Or for the, for the, um, the generations of the cell's offspring. So this is important. Okay, so let's come over here and um, let's say proofreading slash editing. And who can do this? DNA. Yes, yes. So DNA polymerase can proofread or edit. What about RNA polymerases? They, can. they cannot, right? So we put no. And what's important, folks, is to know, well, who cares? What's the, what's the consequence? So let's look at final mistake rates. So let me start first, you guys, with RNA polymerase because we want to we want to see the initial mistake rate becomes the final mistake rate for RNA polymerases, right? Because they can't proofread. And again, folks, this will this will um, the mistake rate will vary for the organism for the gene. We're going to give an approximation. So the mistake rate, you guys, for RNA polymerases is going to be one wrong nucleotide. in every 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth nucleotides. And again, you guys, that's, that's an incredibly high um, mistake rate. Um, yeah, that's really high mistake rate. Yeah. So now, in contrast, folks, in DNA polymerases, after they, they proofread and, ed and edit, it's amazing how they reduce the mistake rate. So their final mistake rate, again, it depends on the organism and the gene. It's going to be one wrong nucleotide And again, folks, it, it all depends. It could be from 10 to the 8. Some folks say up to 10 to the 10th nucleotides. So at the, at the very least here, it's a 10, 10 to the 4th reduction in mistake rates. And you guys, since DNA is genetic information of cells, what do we call mistakes that are made when DNA is copied? This is the mutation rate, right? So one mutation in every 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9th, excuse me, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10th nucleotides. And again, you guys, on the um, lecture exam, it's a range of mistake rates. So if you're anywhere between 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 11th, you know, one wrong um, nucleotide, one mutation every 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 11th nucleotides in cells, that's fine. And, and indeed, you guys, because DNA is the genetic information of cells, we have to have this really low mutation rate, right? Mutation rate's that high, we'd probably be just shivering globs of jello on the floor somewhere, not to show disrespect to jello. Okay, all right. Now, furthermore, I do, I do understand you guys, this is kind of like, okay, but it's not very exciting. So where do we find some really important application here? When we start talking about viruses, right? And after our genetics section, we'll have a unit on viruses. This becomes so important, folks. So OK, 
Okay, so let's let's do application here. Like, who cares? Okay, well now let's look at viruses. So folks, we know there's two basic types of viruses based on what they use as their genetic information. So can you help me out here, you guys? What am I talking about? Which two groups of viruses? Good, DNA viruses. And what would be the other group? RNA viruses, right. Okay, so you guys, when we start talking about how viruses replicate, DNA viruses would, will um, use which enzymes to copy their DNA? Which enzyme is going to copy viral DNA? And it's not a trick question, you guys. DNA polymerase, all right? And do DNA polymerases proofread? Yes. Yeah. So do you think DNA viruses will have a very high mutation rate? No, right? Because DNA polymerases proofread, right? So DNA, DNA viruses generally don't have a really high mutation rate. In contrast to who? RNA. RNA viruses. Now, you guys, which enzyme is going to copy viral RNA to make RNA? And I know this is weird, but we'll get to it. So which enzyme do you know makes RNA? Let's just go there. Which enzyme makes RNA? RNA polymerases. What can't RNA polymerases do? Proofread. No proofread. Who cares? What's the consequence? Really high mutation rate. Potential for incredibly high mutation rates, right? So we can say thus, high mutation rates. And folks, you know this already. Guess what, guess what the genetic information of HIV is? RNA, RNA right? Um, guess what the genetic information of influenza viruses are? RNA, RNA right? So we'll, we'll, we'll start with influenza viruses, folks. Why do you have to get a new flu vaccine every year? Because the influenza strains are mutating so rapidly. And we'll see it's even more complicated. They're actually sharing, recombining genetic information. But certainly the fact that when their RNA is copied, lots of mistakes are, are made. That means the influenza viruses are constantly doing what? Mutating, right? So uh, influenza vaccine that protects you against one strain of influenza one year might not be able to protect you from a mutant strain the next year. And folks, why, why we need this desperately, an HIV vaccine. Why don't we have an effective HIV vaccine? Oh my gosh, HIV, they, their mutation rate is absolutely insane. And we'll see you guys, it's because there's more than one step where, um, RNA polymerases, or the equivalent of RNA polymerases, or let me say, let me back up, folks. I, I miss, I really did, I, I said that incorrectly. We're going to see you guys in viruses with HIV. There's a couple of steps where their genetic information gets copied, and and it both those steps, the enzymes that are involved, can't proofread or edit. So HIV has this phenomenally high mutation rate, and that means. If I get infected with an HIV strain today, probably by the end of the month, I might have hundreds of mutant strains circulating in my body. So you guys, why, so, so what? Why can't we make an HIV vaccine? Yeah, yeah, we, we have we haven't, there must be, you know, like, it's gonna be Nobel Prize winning. There's something we don't understand about vaccine development. We don't have the knowledge to develop a vaccine that will protect us against all those mutant strains of HIV, right? And again, that's a reflection of their high mutation rate, right? How, what does this have to do with jelly beans? So what is she talking about? I'm getting hungry, you can tell I start talking about food. So again, folks, HIV is what kind of virus? RNA virus. What are the enzymes that are going to make RNA? RNA polymerases, and do they proofread? No, they don't. And as a result, RNA viruses have high mutation rates, right? Okay. And not only for vaccine, I'll stop after this. Um, but this also means, folks, that your immune system can't keep up, right? That's why if you get infected with influenza virus, right, you can get infected a year or 10 years later with another strain, right? Our immune system can't keep up with all the strains. The same goes for HIV. Um, oh, and the last thing that's really bad news is that with rapid mutation rates, viruses can become resistant to our antiviral drugs. And again, you guys, HIV is the, the model virus for that. It rapidly becomes resistant to our antiviral drugs. 
And that's why if I'm being treated for HIV, I'm going to be on um, multiple anti-HIV drugs trying to prevent the um, evolution of um, drug-resistant HIV. Anyway, we'll come back to HIV and influenza in the virus section, but they are doggone RNA viruses. Don't turn your back on them, you guys. Okay. So, folks, let's see here. Now, will this table or some derivative of it, will that be on lecture exam two short answers? Yeah, good, good. Okay. All right, you guys, are we ready to leave DNA replication right now? Yeah. Okay. So, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to leave DNA replication. We're going to presume our little E. coli has copied its chromosome, and it, now it's divided into two little cells. Um, but the E. coli, you know, hmm, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need to um, make more proteins, safer active transport. It certainly is going to have to make a lot of proteins um, for enzymes, right, to help metabolize nutrients. Um, maybe it, uh, E. coli has flagella, right? It needs to make some protein so it can move about. So the next part of information flow we're going to take a look at, you guys, in cells is how DNA can guide protein synthesis. And we're going to express this as gene expression. Yeah? Do we have to know the charge precursors? Just know that the cell needs um, nucleoside triphosphates to make DNA or RNA. So you can just use the generic name, nucleoside triphosphates. You don't need to know the adenosine, triphosphate, any of those. Know, know that the cells to make DNA or RNA, they have to have nucleoside triphosphates. Okay, yeah, good, good question. Thank you. So again, folks, because as we said, it's so easy to get lost amongst all the details. And whenever, whenever I start getting lost, I always I want to literally pull out my roadmap to find out where am I, which town am I in, which state am I in. So for our roadmap, right, we're going to use the central dogma of information flow in cells developed by Francis Crick. So you guys, we just talked about how DNA can act as a template for DNA synthesis, right? So this, what does this little cartoon mean? DNA replication. The cell has to replicate its DNA before it divides in two, right? So that was, that was the first process. We've just finished it, you guys. So we're going to do DNA replication. Check. Just finish that. Right? But now, folks, remember, let's say our lily coli has just divided. Does it need to make proteins? Maybe for active transport, um, motility, needs to make enzymes. Yeah, okay. So what we're going to do then is look at, the, at another process altogether. And this is the process where DNA is going to act as a guide to make RNA. What's that called, folks? Transcription? And then the RNA will act as a guide to make what? Proteins, right? And the proteins will be our enzymes, uh, transport proteins, uh, proteins for motility. And what's that process called? Translation, awesome. And so, folks, for us, we're going to call this two-step process gene expression. So we're going to define gene expression, you guys, is how information encoded in DNA gets uh, transcribed and translated into the amino acid sequence of proteins, okay? So it's going to be two steps. The first step is what? Transcription. The second step is translation, yeah. Okay. Now, in cells, folks, is this the direction of information flow in cells? Yeah. Who laughs, who laughs in our face? Who can do this? Who can do this? Reverse transcription, who does that? Who, do, who are we just talking about? Yeah, so the retroviruses, right, backwards viruses, and who's the most notorious? HIV. Um, do you know a name of an enzyme that could carry out this process? Reverse transcriptase. And again, folks, when we get to viruses, we'll come back to this. I'm just kind of planting little seeds so that when we do talk about HIV, a lot of this stuff, you're like, oh, I remember. I remember we discussed that. But remember, you guys, in cells, you know, 99% of the time, this is the information flow. So we're, again, we're going to talk about E. coli. 
And folks, what I wanted to do is um, show you a simple way I was taught transcription back way back when. It's embarrassing. But I kind of like it because it's a lot simpler. The way they taught us was a lot simpler than what I'll show you later. And to me, like when I'm first learning something, I want somebody to show it to me in as simple a way as possible. So folks, um, let me just add a little bit here. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about first about transcription. And again, this is gonna be an E. coli, our little workhorse of genetics. And folks, um, specifically now, I wanna talk about three transcription products. And the three transcription products are going to be messenger RNA or um, mRNA. Can you help me out? There's two more um, RNAs that will be involved in um, translation. Transfer. Say again, sorry? Transfer. Transfer. Excellent, you guys. Transfer RNA. And again, we're bad. We're always using abbreviations. And you guys, I like to remember... Transfer, or the, the T is also meaning translator, because we're going to see transfer RNA is literally the translator molecule. It can read nitrogenous base alphabets of nucleic acids, and it can also read the alphabet of proteins, amino acids. So I like to remember the T also means translator. Okay, and who else are, you know, are we forgetting? Yeah, ribosomal RNA. And this is intriguing, you guys, rRNA. This rRNA in the ribosome, one of the RNA, it will act as a ribozyme. What's a ribozyme? Catalytic RNA, right? It can speed up reaction rates of chemical reactions. And indeed, you guys, it's a ribozyme in the ribosome that catalyzes formation of the peptide bonds between the amino acids. I don't know why that blew me away. I was like, you're kidding, right? So ribosomal RNA helps, literally helps to um, link the amino acids together during protein synthesis. And again, we'll come back to that. Okay, good, all right. So folks, so I'm gonna show you the simple way that I was taught about transcription, and the reason it's simple is they taught us just using the one strand of DNA that's gonna act as a template, right? So remember, there's two strands of DNA in the chromosome. Only one of them will be transcribed. We're gonna call that the template strand. So I'm gonna show you really simplified. So this is gonna be E. coli transcription. Right, we're gonna use DNA as our template. And what are we gonna make? RNA, okay, so RNA will be our product. So which enzymes, you guys, can use DNA as a template and make RNA? RNA polymerase, awesome. So this is gonna be, I'm gonna specify bacterial RNA polymerase, good. All right, so you guys, again, I'm just gonna show the single strand DNA template in black. Right, I'm not going to put any bases in. Um, let me see here. So I need to orient. So this is my three prime end of my DNA. This will be my five prime end of my DNA. Right. And we're going to pretend, you guys, we're the, okay, so <laughs> later this is going to be a virus, but today this is RNA polymerase, right? So um, what RNA polymerase does is it scans DNA looking for a very specific DNA sequence called the promoter. And I'm just going to put it in blue, you guys. If I had green, I'd put it in green. So this is the promoter. And it's to the promoter that RNA polymerase will bind. And we're going to see, we're going to simplify this, you guys. We're going to see if the promoter is the start signal for transcription. Okay? So RNA polymerase is going to bind to the promoter. And then it's going to start transcribing the DNA so I'll just put a little DNA sequence here, you guys. Okay, again, I'll just random. Okay, so if this is the DNA sequence, right? So RNA polymerase binds, it used the DNA sequence as a template to make what? To make RNA. Okay, and what would be, and let's pretend this is mRNA, you guys. 
Okay. So what would the mRNA sequence be? A, U, C, G, C, U. Good. You remember your results are finding awesome, you guys. Now, um, do we have to obey the same rules as DNA synthesis? Mm -hmm. So synthesis, you guys, is from, what's this end? 5 prime, right? 2, 3 prime. Are we anti-parallel to our template? Yes, we are. Okay. And so let me put, let me put a little signal down here. So we're, again, folks, we're simplifying this. We're going to go along. Our RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, right? And it goes along, goes along, goes along. It's transcribing, transcribing, transcribing until it hits the terminator. What's going to happen to the terminator? <laughs> I'm wrapped up in my mRNA, right? So the RNA polymerase is going to release the DNA, and it releases the RNA product. And in this case, you guys, we're pretending this is our mRNA, OK? Oops, that's the wrong color. So where does transcription start, folks, for us? We're simplifying it. Transcription will start at the promoter. So we'll just call this start transcription. And where does it end? Good, terminator. You see how nice that, I liked it in the old days. Think life was simpler. Okay, now folks, just so you know what happens on lecture exam two, folks get confused where the promoter is. I, and, and again, I totally understand this. Um, I ask you where is the promoter located and people will get confused and they'll say it's on the RNA or it's on the mRNA. Where's the promoter? On the DNA, right? So just try to remember that, okay? All right, so with that real simple overview, um, Let's walk through these slides. Okay. We'll add some details here. Okay. So when does transcription begin, folks? When RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. Good. Um, what's the direction of RNA synthesis? Five prime to three prime. Is it anti-parallel to the template? Yes. Okay. Um, and when does transcription stop? At the terminator, good. And folks, I just remembered something else I'm going to ask you. On the lecture exam, I'll give you a DNA sequence and have you replicate the DNA to make complementary DNA. And then I might have you take that same DNA sequence and transcribe it. So that's what you guys just did. You took a DNA sequence and you transcribed it. So I'll ask you to do that on the short answer part of lecture exam. Two, and it seems to me you guys are pretty comfortable with that. OK, good, good, good. All righty. Now, what we want to do is get into a little bit more detail and talk about that RNA polymerase. Okay, so bacterial RNA polymerase is kind of cool because bacterial RNA polymerases are made of two subunits. Sometimes they're called subunits, or sometimes they're called factors. So hopefully that won't that won't um, confuse you too much, you guys. So the two subunits are the first one is called the sigma subunit or sigma factor, and I like to think of this as the brains of RNA polymerase because it's the part that recognizes the promoter and gets transcription started at the correct place. So it recognizes the promoter. So transcription begins at the correct place. We could say the correct site um, on the DNA. And then the second subunit, you guys, is called the core subunit or core factor. And I like to think of this as the workhorse. It's going to do the actual RNA synthesis. And you might you might say, well, why you know why why don't you just have the core subunit, right? 
Why don't you just have the core subunit, since it's doing all the work. But the problem is, folks, the core subunit, it doesn't know where to begin. So if, if this was just the core subunit, instead of finding here at the start of the coding sequence for the protein, it might start here. And then we just synthesize a short little mRNA that when it gets translated, it's a non-functional protein. So it's really, really important that RNA polymerase binds at the start of the coding sequence for the, uh, for, for the protein, right? Otherwise, the core, the core um, subunit would bind here, or it bind there, or it bind here, right? So that um, sigma subunit is really important. So again, folks up here, the bacterial RNA polymerase, two subunits. If I ask you what's the brain, what's the, what's the subunit or the factor that recognizes the promoter, what are you going to tell me? Sigma. And often, folks, you'll see in books, they'll use this little sigma, so it's subunit or factor. If it was a short answer, you could call it the subunit or the factor. Okay. And which part of the RNA polymerase um, actually carries out the RNA synthesis? Core subunit. Good. Okay. And we'll see you guys in a, um, a couple of slides. Once RNA polymerase has started transcription, once the sigma subunit has got RNA polymerase started at the right place, it'll fall off, right? It just gets recycled. Okay. And, and folks, I won't ask this of you, but later on we're going to talk about how cells can control which genes are expressed, meaning which genes will get transcribed and translated. So bacteria can make different types of sigma subunits, which under different environmental conditions will bind to promoters on different genes. So that's one way the bacteria can control which genes will be expressed. Okay, but again, I'm not going to ask that on the exam. It's just kind of cool. Now, um, always, you guys, I always think that antibiotics and toxins are really interesting. So wouldn't it be nice if your patient, let's say your patient was infected with a mycobacterium tuberculosis. Wouldn't it be great if you had an antibiotic that would specifically inhibit the mycobacterium without harming your patient? Right? So, you guys, so what's really nice is bacterial RNA polymerase, it's different enough from human RNA polymerase that we can use it as a unique bacterial target. So I'd like you to know um, a class of antibiotics that will specifically bind to and inhibit bacterial RNA polymerases. And the class of antibiotics, you guys, are called rifamycins, and specifically an example is rifampin. These are pretty cool antibiotics, you guys. Um, they're really important in the treatment of mycobacterium, massive fast infections, so the treatment of tuberculosis and leprosy. And one reason is they have really good penetrating ability. They can penetrate into abscesses. They can penetrate and get into therapeutic levels in the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid. And um, very importantly, they can reach therapeutic levels within macrophages. And we're going to discover when we talk about medical microbiology, mycobacteria can actually replicate in our macrophages. The macrophages are supposed to ingest them and kill them, but because of that thick, waxy cell wall, often the macrophages can't kill them, and the mycobacteria start replicating inside our macrophages. So we're going to need an antibiotic that can cross the cell membrane of the macrophages and get to really high concentration of the cytoplasm, and that's one of the huge advantages of rifampin. It can do that. It's got great penetrating ability. One thing you'll want to um, remember, folks, to tell your patients, um, the family of your patients, and friends, is that if you're on rifampin, it's going to turn everything orange red. So your feces will look orange red, your urine, saliva, your sweat, and your tears. And it can really startle people. They might worry they're, they're what? They're bleeding, right? So warn them ahead of time, right, that this is going to cause discoloration. Um, I worked with rifampin in graduate school, and it's this bright red color. You want to paint with it. It's so beautiful, right? But it can be really upsetting to your patients, right? So just don't know it's okay. It's just the antibiotic. Okay. So again, folks, and, and um, I know this gets boring, these rules, but I hope you're seeing that in nature when a strategy works, you see the same strategy being used over and over again. So a lot of the transcription rules are really similar to DNA replication rules, right? Okay. So what's the template for uh, transcription? Single-strand DNA, right? Um, and do remember, you guys, our, our chromosomal DNA, it's double-stranded. 
usually if, if any one site on the chromosome, only one strand will be transcribed, and that will be called the template strand, okay? So usually both strands are not transcribed. Usually just one strand is transcribed. That's called the template strand. Um, how is RNA synthesized? 5 prime to 3 prime, and what's the orientation to the template? Antiparallel. Awesome, you guys. Do we need those nucleoside triphosphates, those energized precursors? Yes, good. And for, for us, you guys, um, we're only talking about three transcription products that are involved in protein synthesis. And what were those three transcription products? mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. There's many more RNA uh, products, you guys, and they're learning so much more about them. They're really important in controlling gene, gene expression, but we're only going to focus on those three, okay? Um, what's the promoter? The start signal, and where is it located? Yeah. DNA. Good, you guys. What signals transcription stop? Ter terminator. Awesome. Good, you guys. All right. This is the fancier, more accurate view of transcription, folks. Um, and to me, this is always, it's more confusing, like when you're first learning it. So, but it is more accurate, because indeed, you guys, here is our RNA polymerase. This is the core subunit or factor. This is the sigma. Um, subunit or factor. What is the RNA polymerase scanning right now? What do these two lines represent? The double stranded chromosomal DNA, right? So you see, guys, how I simplified it up there? I only put the template strand, but indeed the, the RNA polymerase is scanning the double stranded um, chromosome. When it hits a promoter, right, we're saying this is where transcription will begin. And it's kind of cool, you guys, um, RNA polymerase, it acts as its own helicase. What do we mean it acts as its own helicase? What is it doing? There you go. Yeah, right? Just locally, it's breaking the hydrogen bonds. So that instead of double-stranded DNA, now we have single-strand DNA, right? And remember, folks, only one of the strands will be used as a template. And I'm just cheating here, guys. I see that this is a template strand, 5 prime in, 3 prime in. So I know this is going to be the template strand up here because synthesis is going to be anti-parallel and it'll be 5 prime, 3 prime. Okay, so this is the initiation to start. This is just showing you guys what you already did up on the board, right? Just showing the actual synthesis of the RNA using the DNA as our template. And then, folks, this, I wish they'd use, oh, they did, it is kind of red. What's that special sequence going to be? The terminator, right? And what will happen at the terminator? We're just saying RNA polymerase will release the DNA and also will release the RNA. Good. Okay. And folks, this is just showing, um, it's almost well, it's the closest thing we have to put here. So folks, do notice that once um, RNA polymerase is initiated transcription at the right place to promoter, who's going to fall off? Sigma, right? Because its whole job was just to make sure that the course of unit got started at the right place. And furthermore, you guys, we can have RNA polymerases lined up like this, right? One behind the other. And what's this little squiggle? Yeah, that's RNA, and if, let's see here, what, um, do you know which RNA will be the actual guide for protein synthesis? The messenger RNA is going to be the guide for protein synthesis. Good job, please. All right. Okie dokie. Um, hmm. I'll mention this right now, folks, and we'll come back to it. So, in um, prokaryotes, so members of domain bacteria and archaea, um, often, the genes for their proteins are arranged so that you'll have, say this is a gene for protein 1, protein 2, and protein 3. So what we'll sometimes see on the chromosome is there won't be a transcription terminator between the DNA um, sequences for the, for the different proteins. So it's like, well, who cares? What is, who cares? So what happens if RNA polymerase binds the promoter, It'll transcribe the gene for protein 1, keeps going, transcribes the gene for protein 2, keeps going, transcribes the gene for protein 3 until it hits the terminator. And as a result, the, MR, the mRNA is going to carry information for two or more proteins. And this has a fancy name. This MR, mRNA is called polycystrotic mRNA. And it just means this mRNA that has the information for two or more proteins. Now, right now, folks, maybe just put it on the back burner. When we come back to um, control of gene expression, this will become more important. Okay, but for right now, just put it on the back burner. 
can can eukaryotes, can we make polycystronic? No, we can't. We can only make what's called monocystronic. All of our mRNAs only carry information for one, one protein, one protein only. Yeah. And you guys, um, I do so, you guys saw, I, I do so little on eukaryotes, but I just want to, um, those of you that have had ANP, I know you go into this in much greater detail than I will here, but I do want you to know just some real simple differences in transcription between bacteria and, say, your cells, humans. Okay. Okay. So if we look at, a, say, a bacterium, a prokaryote, so we'll look at a little bacterium, and then we'll compare it, say, to a eukaryote. So, for example, folks, we can look at a human cell. So we're going to see, and this is one reason I love bacteria, um, transcription in human cells and eukaryotes is so much more complicated. Oh, my gosh, it makes me tired just thinking about it. So you guys, let's take a look first at our bacterium, and let us presume this is our, our chromosome. This is the chromosome. Okay. So, and the chromosome is where in the bacterium? In the cytoplasm, right? I love it. No compartment. So you guys, where does DNA replication occur in bacteria? In the cytoplasm, right? Where does transcription occur? The cytoplasm. Good. So you guys, let's pretend this is our RNA polymerase. And then, oh, I should have used different colors. Oh, well. And let's say this is the little transcription product. And let's say you guys were eventually going to do protein synthesis. So this would be which transcription product? This is going to be the guide for protein synthesis? Good. This is going to be our mRNA. Okay. All right. And eventually we're going to see that translation also occurs in the cytoplasm. And indeed, you guys, it's so cool. In bacteria, as soon as this little 5' prime end of the mRNA is made, even before transcription is finished, um, we'll have ribosomes attaching. So these are the ribosomes that attach. And we're going to see you guys, it's at the ribosomes at which process occurs. Yeah, translation or protein synthesis. So this is so efficient, you guys. Even before transcription is finished in bacteria, the ribosomes have already bound to the mRNA, and they're already starting to translate the mRNA even before transcription is finished. Right? So this gives us an idea. Why is it like E. coli can double every 20 minutes? It's like, man, it's so efficient. Starts protein synthesis translation even before transcription is finished, right? So we can see you guys here with... Um, we give this guy a name, so RNA polymerase is carrying out transcription. So we can see that in bacteria, transcription and translation, they're not separated in space, and we could argue they're not separated in time, right? They're almost happening at the same time. But is this true in our cells? Right, right? We're a lot slower, aren't we? Well, no wonder. It's, gosh, our cells have such a hard go. So, folks, where are our chromosomes located? Where are our chromosomes located? Nucleus. Nucleus, right? And do you know where our ribosomes are located? There you go. Good. So, you guys notice that because we're going to, our uh, chromosomal DNA is in the nucleus, so DNA replication occurs in the nucleus. Where does transcription occur? In the nucleus, right? Where is translation going to occur? Yeah. So since our ribosomes are in the cytoplasm, that's where translation will occur. Since our chromosomes, and I'll just put one, you guys, so this will be the chromosomal DNA. Right? Since our chromosomes are in the nucleus, where will transcription occur? In the nucleus, right? So you guys here, I'll put our RNA polymerase. And 
And remember, this is transcription. So again, you guys, where does transcription occur in eukaryotic cells? In the nucleus, right? Where does translation occur, protein synthesis? In the cytoplasm, right? So does this make sense that you can't have simultaneous transcription and translation in eukaryotes? Because the two processes are separated in space and in time, right? OK. Now, and furthermore, you guys, no wonder we're all tired. Look at what's going on in, during transcription. Okay, so this will be, this little, this is going to be our RNA. I'm not even going to call it mRNA yet because your cells have to go through all this editing of your RNA. It's amazing. So, folks, this is, what's this, you guys, right here? This is the nucleus. This is the cytoplasm, okay? So what's crazy in eukaryotes, folks, is the DNA, there's like two types of DNA, exons and introns. And um, one, one book said, think of exons as they're the DNA that will be expressed, meaning the DNA that will become, eventually, when it's transcribed and processed, will become the mRNA. Introns, that DNA sequence, when it's transcribed into RNA, those introns are going to be cut out. They aren't going to get expressed. Isn't this wild? So folks, so when our DNA is first transcribed, we're not going to call this mRNA yet. We're just going to call it the RNA transcript. And notice there's all these exon RNA and intron RNAs here. So part of the editing, what's happening to the intron RNA in your cells? Yeah, the intron RNA is going to get cut out. And then what's going to happen to the, the exon? It sounds like a gasoline. What's going to happen to the exon RNA? They're going to be spliced together, right? <coughs> right. So here we have splicing together of the exons. And it's even crazier than this, folks, because your cells will further chemically modify the ends of the mRNA. So it's not just cutting and splicing. It's further chemically modifying the ends before we have mature mRNA. Whew, I'm exhausted just even thinking about it. So you guys, once we have our edited mRNA, where must the mRNA travel to be translated? In a cytoplasm, right? So you see how, it, how it's so complicated, you guys, in eukaryotes. I'm so glad we get to talk about bacteria. Okay? But do, again, you folks, notice, I should do this. So we have RNA editing, editing. We have cutting, splicing, and then further chemical modification. And I'll just show it as arrows, you guys. So arrow, 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 until eventually what do we end up with? mRNA. And where does it go for translation? Yeah, right. So exactly, you guys. Translation is going to occur in the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are located. Good. So the bacteria is so much more efficient than we are. OK, you guys. So, um, now, the next step, you guys, in um, gene expression, translation, this is so comp I mean, it's, it's incredible, but it's so complicated. So what we're going to do, we're going to treat it like an onion. We're going to do one layer at a time. We're going to start really simple, big, big, big concept, and then we'll keep peeling back layers till we get down to the, the little details of exactly what's going on in the ribosome. But to start with, we want to do big picture, okay? So folks, easy. Okay, we're going to do it in bacteria, okay? So you guys, where are, it, uh, how, let me see here, how would I word this? Where does translation occur in cells? Good, cytoplasm. And specifically where in the cytoplasm, what structure acts as the workbench for translation? Ribosomes, awesome, you guys, good. So we're going to be working in the ribosome, we're going to be working the cytoplasm with the ribosomes in our bacteria, good job. Okay. And what will be the template, what will be the guide for the ribosomes? The mRNA, yeah, the mRNA is going to be the template, the guide. And um, what will be the translation products? What does the cell make during translation? So, and sorry, you guys. So, what, what's the cell going to make during translation? Proteins. Good. Okay. So, you guys, we're going to tackle this part right here. So, translation, we're going to need um, ribosomes. We're going to need our mRNA. Okay. Ribosomes, and remember you guys, ribosomes are protein plus ribosomal RNA. We're going to need mRNA. We're going to need our little translator molecule, or tRNAs. What else do we need? 
What are our building blocks? Amino acids, good. Okay. And we'll also need energy sources like ATP, but I'm not going to include them in here. Okay. So, folks, if we're talking about translation, right, we're going to use mRNA as our template to make what? Protein, and it's going to occur where? Ribosomes and bacteria, where are the ribosomes? Side lab, good. All right. And again, folks, this is just the outermost layer of our onion. Okay, so let me, let me take, let me take an mRNA. Okay, and I'm going to put little triplets of nitrogenous bases, okay? Okay, so see these triplets, you guys? Three nitrogenous bases. So these triplets are called codons. And they are numbers starting at the five prime end of our mRNA. So this is codon one. This is codon what? Two. And which codon is this? Three. Good. Now, the incredible event at the ribosome is that with the help of tRNA, these codons are going to be translated into specific amino acids. So each codon um, represents an amino acid, except for three that are called stop codons, right? So this kind of Rosetta Stone of how you can take the nitrogenous bases and mRNA codon and know which amino acid it will be translated into, this Rosetta Stone is known as the genetic code. Can you, can you believe how exciting that was, you guys, when they discovered this? I, just, it's, I still find it mind-blowing. So you guys, so on the lecture exam two, on the short answer section, I'm going to give you a DNA sequence. And I'm going to have you transcribe it into an mRNA sequence. I'm going to give you the genetic code table. And I'm going to have you transcribe your mRNA into what? Protein. So let's do it right now just in this last minute or two, you guys. So you don't have to memorize the genetic code table. Am I going to give it to you on the exam? Yes, but you have to know how to read it. So help me out, you guys. So within a codon, each base has a number. So this is base one, two, three. Tell me out. Base one, two, three. Base one, two, three. Good. So you guys, let's translate this first codon, A-U-G. So the first codon, you guys, is along this side. So the first codon is A, right? So I know my codon is here. A, the second, the second base is up on the top. So A-U, the junction is right here. If you wanted to, you can go over here for the third one. But folks, I just find it's easier just by inspection, just to look for it. So you guys, A to G will be translated into. These are abbreviations, you guys. The um, genetic code on your exam will have the full name of the amino acid. So AUG is going to be translated into the amino acid called methionine. All right, and, and now you guys, can you help me out? Um, the mRNA code on CGC is going to be translated into which amino acid? CGC. So C, we know it's here somewhere. C, G, we know it's here somewhere. C, G, C. Yeah, A, R, G is arginine. And again, folks, don't worry. Um, your genetic code team will have the full name of the amino acids. So now, folks, in the ribosome, what's going to happen between these two amino acids? What's going to be formed? Peptide bond, right? Who's going to form the peptide bond? The, yeah, the ribosomal RNA, the ribozyme. Isn't that cool? Okay, and last one. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm confused on the, uh, the start. Okay, so for right now, we're not going to do start and stops. Okay. Right now, we're just getting a feel for how to use the table. And then we'll come. I mean, so it does, I can't quite see it. Does it say MET during the? Yeah, it does, it says MET or start. Okay, so. So you guys, so yeah, so what Charles was saying is that um, 
Um, just like we had a, like a promoter on mRNA is a start signal for transcription. Amp, amp, oh, I said that wrong, you guys. There's a promoter on DNA that's a start signal for transcription, right? So mRNA also has to have a start signal. And what Charles was just sharing is the first AUG on mRNA is called the start of codon. That's where the ribosomal start protein synthesis. For, for us, you guys, we're just kind of practicing how to use the, the chart. And then what we'll do on, um, what is today, you guys? Tuesday. Tuesday. My gosh. On Thursday, we'll come back and explore the start and stop codons, right? Okay. You guys, just as an end here, just help me out. U, U, U will be translated into BAG is phenylalanine. Okay. And you guys, that was just a quick okay. overview, and we'll go into more details on Thursday. Awesome. Okay. We can. It's formed by the uh, ribozyme, the ribosomal RNA. I, I don't know why. I just think that is the coolest thing. Uh oh. I hope. I hope this was recording. I think it was.